Sex, decadence, glamour. How would you sum up best-selling author Jackie Collins' work? Well, maybe with those three words. And, well, Jackie Collins is back and just as prolific as ever. Her 30th book, Confessions of a Wild Child, just hit the stands in the US today. And Jackie is here on set with us to talk about it now. Hey, Jackie, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm good to so see well. you. It's you so just put up the English cover. We did the English cover. I know. Yes. Well, yes. Well, well yeah. uh, we do, we're international here. Oh, oh, here's the, here's the American, American cover. And, yeah, yes. We, we're, 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 we're international. Yes, you're right. Dipping the in both waters. You're right, yes. Uh, first of all, congratulations. Thank you. This is yet another kind of string to your many, many, well, you know, enormous Well, it was exciting bow. because, you know, it's Confessions of a Wild Child and it's Lucky Sant'Angelo when she's a teenager. And I thought, I want to go back in time, you know, see what she was like, how she became the strong woman she is today because everybody loves her so much. All my readers and they come to me on, you know, Twitter and stuff where I'm Jackie J. Collins and they go, oh, we want more lucky, we want more lucky. And what was she like as a teenager and do it from her point of view. Yeah. So I did. Do you feel like you got more license to, to sort of write a teenage narrative? Because obviously it's that time of like, you know, um, trying things out and uh, sort of... Yes, you. and it was great to do. I had two of my godchildren staying with me at the time, both 18, and they were running around town going to the clubs and the next day they'd be telling me all the exciting things that they'd done and it was like, uh, oh, this is great, I'm getting all that energy from them. And then, of course, once I started to write it, it took me back to my teenage years, which were pretty wild too. And so I was getting this kind of feeling of, you know, being a teenage lucky as I wrote the book. It was great. So were there any moments in the book that were sort of direct, kind of, you know, lifting out of your own... Uh, your yes, own there were, as a matter of fact. Um, I uh, wrote the South of France scenes. I used to go to the South of France all the time when I was a teenager. And I had an aunt who had an apartment there and she was never there, so I could stay at the apartment by myself. And I you would didn't take, take her Mercedes though, did you? Uh, no. <laughs> And I would take the bus to, uh, to Jean Lapin, where I would hang out on the beach. And in the book, there's this, uh, like, tennis tables, table tennis at the back of the beach and all these different guys. And, yeah, I was there. Yes, so that you, was me. So that was really, that was a kind of a window into your, uh, your teenage A little well. bit, yes, because I will eventually write my autobiography, which I have started, which is called um, Reform School or Hollywood, because I was thrown out of school when I was 15. And uh, I, I wanted to capture that. But I open my book completely differently. I go, uh, don't move uh, blank or I'll blow your blanking head off, which was said to me by a nice rubber in Beverly Hills with an Uzi in my face. You can, you can tell Two me inches the, from my nose. You can tell me the blanks. We're, we're half post live. You can, oh, you can, okay. you can don't say the blanks. Don't move, bitch, or I'll blow your fucking head off. So that was nice. I thought, hmm, okay, that's how I'm going to open my book. Though. How, when was that? How, what, what oh, it was about, I don't know, eight years ago, something like that. Yeah. How did you respond? I responded like Lucky because I was writing Lucky at the time and I thought, screw you. I mean, you are so nasty and horrible and you've got so much hate towards me and I don't even know you. You had a full mask on. And I, I, I managed to get the car into reverse and take off and zoomed off. And I was really lucky because afterwards people said to me, Uzi in your face, do you know if it just moved his thumb, you would all have been blown away because I had two other people in the car. That's, I mean, that's... So it was an exciting adventure, which of course I put in a book. Well, I, love yes. that I love that you make it an exciting adventure when for other people it would just be like a damn right scary moment. That well, I tell you, people. it was scary afterwards. For about a year, I couldn't sit in my car at a, at a red light. I had to immediately turn to the right because I knew somebody was going to come up to me with a gun. And for about a year, that went on, and then that, then I was fine. Gosh, that's quite terrifying. It, it is. It's not nice, because then you think about it after. You know, you escape, but after the fact, you think, oh, my God, what could have happened? Yeah. I mean, what are your views yeah. on guns? I mean, obviously, it was like a gun. It's a, it's a scary thing. I think if people, people should have them to protect themselves, because the criminals are going to get them anyway. So I think if you can have a gun, you should, if you want one. Do you have a gun? Uh, I do, yeah. Do you and carry it with you or what is it? No, like a... no, no, I don't. I just keep it lying around to shoot anybody who gets into my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I feel like, I don't know if I could do that. You know, I feel like, you know, if somebody was going to be breaking my house, my, my father and I used to have this kind of uh, back and forth as well because yes. he, he was very an advocate of like, you know, we should have a gun in the house. And my yeah. stepmother would always say, no, we shouldn't have a gun in the house or children in the house. And, you know, be this sort of back and forth. I don't know if I could use a gun on somebody else. I don't know. Well, Would it you depends. Better do that moment? No, I don't know. You don't know until the moment. You do not know in a situation what you are going to do until it happens to you. And that's what I say to people. You know, you say to people, be careful. They say, oh, nothing's ever going to happen to me. But it happened to me. And I did have this gun in my face. And it was two inches from my nose. And I really feel I had an angel watching over me because I, you know, it was a very dodgy situation. I was in somebody's driveway. I had to back out to get out. The guy was there. He had a, a, a partner in a car parked just there, waiting, also with a mask on. So, 
you know, I had a lucky escape. A lucky escape. You had a lucky escape. Oh, my God, I bring the plug in everywhere. Uh, it's, no, it's fantastic. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, but yeah. let us, let us uh, do go back to the book. I feel like in that moment you were quite feisty. I mean, you know, in that, in that moment where you sort of, yes. you know, kind of Definitely. face to face with an Uzi, it was a pretty kind Yeah, of because I was writing moment. her at the time. She probably gave me, you know, that impetus. Right, well, so uh, I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about that because I was reading an interview recently uh, and I, 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 I forget where. It was actually in HuffPost and you told Dustin uh, Fit Harris uh, this, this oh, quote. I love Dustin. Uh, he's, he's wonderful. You, yeah. you said, I don't use the word feminist, but I think I'm a kick-ass woman. I like discussion. I like talking with people who have something to say. Uh, so, you know, on that note, and you're just about lucky, you know, why don't you relate to feminists, do you think? Because feminists always conjures up a picture of a bunch of women ripping off their bras and throwing them away, which is so ridiculous. Would you see a bunch of men ripping off their underpants, oh yeah, David Beckham, and throwing them away? Uh, you wouldn't, you know, and it's kind of like a cliche. But I am a feminist in my own particular way. I mean, of course, I want equal rights for women. And I've always written about the double standard that exists between men and women, and it really pisses me off. And I've always written about that from my first book, which is way, way back, The World is Full of Married Men, when you probably weren't even born. And, um, you know, I, I, love, I love creating um, characters that are strong, female characters that are strong, that can do anything a man can do, except physically, because men are physically stronger. And that's a fact of life. But women can do anything men can do. I mean, I, and they should be equally paid for it, too. Well, well that's actually that's a good point, you know, in terms of, like, pay. Do you feel like there have been moments in your life where you definitely haven't kind of been paid the same as, as men? Maybe? Yes, definitely. I, I really feel it. As successful as I've been, I still am a woman, and dealing with people in business is not always the same. It's not always the same, and I know that. And I think to myself, would they talk to Harold Robbins like this, or would they talk to James Patterson like this, or would they give him this runaround, you know? It's interesting. Have you kind of, in a, have you in a moment sort of evoked a bit of the Robbins kind of spirit, and, and you know, just sort of call bullshit when you've seen bullshit? Yeah, I always call bullshit. Deal? I mean, I, I'm, I'm very outspoken. I say what I want to say, and too bad if it offends somebody. You know? Yeah, well, yeah. No, I, th I think it's, it, 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 I feel like sometimes it's easier for me. I definitely have that mindset. I try and be that way. But I think sometimes it's harder to execute. Like, if there have been moments where you've kind of walked away and you thought, damn it, I wish, I wish I'd it. said that. Yeah. Yes, yes, I wish I'd said that. Yeah. Yes, often, yes. But I feel like I w you would never, that would never happen to you. Well, I no, like I, so was, I was doing an interview in New York once, about 10 years ago or something, and the guy, and it was a good interview. It was for the, I think it was, well, it was one of the big papers. I won't say which one. And I was doing the interview at the, um, at a kind of private conference room. And as I walked out of the conference room, the guy pinched my ass. And I thought, how dare you? So you know what I did? I just turned around, smiled, and pinched his ass, and then walked out. <laughs> I thought, there's equality for you. <laughs> I think that's great. The moral of the story is if your ass gets pinched, pinch back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's Jackie a good moral. Jackie said so. There we yeah, are. I said See? so. <laughs> well, you know, let's, let's talk about Lucky a little bit more uh, and, yeah. and kind of the book because, uh, you know, I, it, was, it was kind of refreshing to kind of go back and sort of have some of these, uh, these kind of moments and the explorations of a sexual awakening. Uh, and, it, you know, it kind of got me thinking about, you know, in terms of the author, your own sort of like moments of sexual right. awakening. Do you feel, do you remember that, so, those sort of parts of your life? Do you remember those kind of... 15, of course you do. Life? Yeah, I mean, when you, when you write, especially when you write, it takes you right back. And I wanted Lucky to be really smart because she's an old soul even though she was 15, 16, and she has this relationship with her father, which is very kind of dodgy because when she's four years old, she discovers her mother floating dead in the family swimming pool. And he's so freaked out by this. He's kind of a gangster that he locks her up in a Bel Air mansion until she's 15. And then he says, okay, I'm gonna send you to boarding school in Switzerland. And then that's the first time she gets any freedom. And, you know, uh, and she does meet a lot of boys and she hooks up with this girl, Olympia Stanilopoulos, who is the um, daughter it's of a, a Greek, name. Greek billionaire. Of course, this is a Jackie Collins book, so well, you have to have... You've got to have the good you know, name. Yeah, and I, I, I guess I've been lucky enough or unlucky enough in my life to observe all these people firsthand. You know, I know all these characters so well. And you write about what you know. People want to write books, and I say to them all the time, write about what you know. If you work in Bloomingdale's, write about that, you know. I mean, I was in Bloomingdale's once, and uh, this guy was selling me beach towels, and he said to me, oh, Miss Collins, if you knew what went on behind the scenes here, you'd have a bestseller. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> so everybody has something that they want to say. Well, so, you know, on, on the idea of everyone has something to, uh, that they want to say, do, do things change with age? I, I want to actually, there's a moment in the book, and, and sorry, this is it's very geeky, but this is about Aunt Althea, uh, Olympia's aunt in the book. And yeah. uh, it's at this moment, Lucky reflecting on this, uh, on this aunt and saying she's 40-something. Do people of that advanced age still enjoy sex? Well, that's what teenagers think. 
You know, have you ever met a teenager that thinks their parents have sex? Never. No, absolutely. It would, they're, they're like freaked out if they even think about that. So also Lucky, who has this huge crush on Marco, who's this gorgeous, handsome kind of chief uh, aide of, of Gino the Ram, who is her father, um, she has this crush on him, and he's like 30. And she goes, oh, but he's so old, you know? She's 15, well, he's what, so old. When you're 15, 30 is really ancient. What about sex with age? You know, that, you know do you feel that it, sex has, has got better with age for you? Or is it something that still continues to get better? Do you reach a point where you're sort of at the peak of your sexual prowess as a woman you know, and I, different I from men? I think that uh, I never kiss and tell. <laughs> I think that I never talk about my sex life or my money. I only write about other people's. <laughs> So what's that done for you by doing that? What do you feel? By you doing like that, I've managed to keep my private life really private. And when I write my autobiography, I'll probably come out with everything. Yeah. Do you want to do that? Do you feel like a need to kind of just like... I, I feel that there has to be, almost. yeah, there has to be kind of line between me and my characters. Do you know what I mean? I'm not one of my characters. I wouldn't mind being Lucky Sant'Angelo, but I'm not one of my characters. So I have to keep that line clear to myself. Yeah. Well, these days it feels like there are, there are no such things as lines. Oh, there's no, there's no lines anymore. Yeah. yeah. But there's lines that you can create for yourself. Well, yeah, what do, what do you think about that and the people that, you know, there are celebrities that air their dirty laundry on like, oh, Twitter and Facebook? What do you think it's of that? It's crazy. No, I, I was watching a reality show the other night, a bunch of women screaming at each other and, you know, dragging each other down and announcing how big their husband's penis was. And I thought, you know what? That's too much information. Every time I see the husband now, I'm imagining him, you know? So there are th some things that you should leave you know, for the imagination. It depends, I suppose it depends yeah. on which, which gentleman it was. I mean, if you're reading a book, it's different. My books are very graphic, they're very raunchy. It's different because it's a private thing, you're reading a book. But if you're on a television show and millions of people are watching you, do you really want to say how big your boyfriend or your husband's penis is? I don't think so. Well, yeah, I mean, and I don't think you'd be thrilled if it was small. <laughs> Well, that's, that's true, too. So you're not a fan. Do you watch, like, Beverly, uh, you know, House, Housewives of Beverly I am Hills a TV like addict. That? I'm a TV addict and a, and a popular culture junkie. Uh, I have four TVs in my bedroom, and I watch everything. Well, not everything. Everything I like. You know, everything from The Blacklist to Dexter, which, of course, is finished, to um, Parenthood, which is a great family-oriented show, to some of the reality shows. I like some of them. I like the Orange County Housewives because they're so bizarre. And they've been there the longest, and they're kind of the ones that really count. And I love late-night shows like Craig Ferguson and Chelsea and Ross and people like that. And uh, I love, you know, watching interesting television that, that's either over the top or is just good drama. Well, speaking of interesting television, I mean, it, you know, Confessions of Wild Child's actually been option, doesn't it, to be... To be a movie. movie. And I'm going to do this great thing. I'm going to, on my website, in a couple of months when we get it all set up, I'm going to set up a, a special site on the website where people can send in their videos of Teenage Lucky, you know, if they think they want to be an actress or if they are an actress and they're between the ages of 15 and I think between the ages of 15 and 19, they can send in their tapes. Like, you know, how the, on The Bachelor, they yeah, send in yeah, their tapes. I want to be on The tapes. Bachelor. By the way, The Bachelor, that's pathetic. Why, I do, mean, we, why I, do you think The Bachelor is pathetic? I think it's pathetic. pathetic because, you know, these women are coming on television and, and they meet him once and they go, but I loved him so much and, and now he's discarded me. And you're like, get a fucking life. Oh, my God. Uh, so and like he's a, like preening around like king of the castle. There's a cacophony of agreement in my ear. The control room all agree with you. Oh, I good, mean, good, good. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised that all the women aren't saying how large his penis is, <laughs> especially when they go into the fantasy room. So what, do you think that all TV nowadays is just dross, just sort of rubbish? No, shows? I love I mean, TV. You mentioned some shows that you enjoy. Oh, yeah, there's, no, there's tons of shows so to enjoy, tons of them. The, Orange is the New Black and all those shows, you know. So why um, the thirst, do you think? or, or Where is this coming from, the, the drive to kind of like put out some more of the, the, the bachelors and things like that. Is that. Do you feel like that's a lust from the I, audience? You know what? I that? feel that teenage girls today, if you talk to a teenage girl today and say, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? They'll say, I want to be famous. And that's sad. And I think they feel that because you know how many housewives there are on those shows? There's 50. There's 50 of them because there's eight on each show and then they have the discarded ones. So there's 50 women out there who feel that they've become incredibly famous and are really, you know, preening in it. And you're like, no, this is what Andy Warhol said, 15 minutes of fame, baby, and that's it. But you, you've transcended that because you are, you know, this is definitely more than 15 minutes now. Oh, my God, I've been doing this for hundreds of years. <laughs> well, I feel like I have anyway. But, uh, no, I've been writing longer than anybody, and I'm, I'm lucky enough to still get on the bestseller list and to enjoy it. And I have a passion for what I do. I love what I do. I really 
love creating strong women and Lucky is a strong woman. And I loved creating her as a teenager because I want teenagers to read this book too. I wrote it as a young adult book. And when I delivered it to my publishers, they said, oh, no, 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 this is Lucky Sant'Angelo. This is for everybody. They're all going to love it. And the strange thing is that all agents are loving it. And I write for all ages, all colors, all sexual orientation. I write for everybody. I don't write little, you know, thrillers that are just three characters. I write a big picture so that you, you know, Lucky has a gay brother. And, and one of the things I particularly like in Confessions is the fact that he comes to her and reveals that he's gay. And he's only 14, and she understands totally. But she says to him, whatever you do, do not tell our father, because right. he's going to freak out. You know, Gino Sant'Angelo, Gino the Ram, a real ladies' man, but a real Italian kind of, you know, macho. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's an interesting character. The, the brother is an interesting character because, you know, obviously he does have this uh, uh, sort of secret. I mean, he is kind of closeted with his father, not with, not with Lucky. But, not with you know, Lucky, with, but with, with his, his father, father, yes. You know, what do you sort of think about how that's evolved? Obviously, you've seen, uh, you know, in your lifetime, I've the way that people have changed so much. and doors have opened. Yeah, when I had a book called Married Lovers, I had this fabulous rock and roll bus, and we went to, like, 25 cities in the South. And I would speak at, uh, actually, it was... Um, um, it was, uh, you know, Harris Casino promoted it. So I would go to all the Harris Casinos and I would sign books and do a speech. And I would be in all these funny little towns in the South, you know. And, and sometimes there would be a young boy and he would come up to me and he'd say, you know, your books have really saved me. And as soon as I've got enough money, I'm moving to New York or Los Angeles. But, you know, if it, it's just so sad that there's bullying in this world. Bullying is so cruel and nasty and horrible and, you know, Kids are killing themselves from being bullied on the internet. Mm. And then when you see some of the comments people make on the internet because they're completely anonymous and they can say what they like about you, um, all I can say to celebrities is never read about yourself on the internet. Well, have you had, I mean, have you had people? I don't read about myself on the internet. I did once and that was it. I thought, I don't think so. I mean, I love Twitter, you know, because I... And you can you get rid of people on Twitter if you don't like it, you know? Well, that, that's what you can Facebook. block them. Yeah, block them. Yeah, that's interesting. I used to have an English drag queen who used to come and say the most appalling things, and I let him do it for a while, and then I go, oh, fuck it, and I blocked him. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, people like Piers Morgan love it. He writes every insult. Yeah, what do you, what do you think of Piers, actually? I, I love Piers. He's a really good friend. He's very, very interesting. Do you he's, think he's, he's a great a, interview. had a bad, you know, sort of rap over here? I do think he's had a bad rap, and I interviewed him for Brit Week in... Uh, in Los Angeles, and I put on my Twitter, I'm going to be interviewing Piers Morgan. What would you like me to ask him? And as one, I guess they were all English, came back and they said, ask him why he's such a twat, ask him why he's such a jerk, ask him why he's such a see you next Tuesday. And I'm like, what? And so I asked him, that was my first question to him in the interview, and he loved it. He was laughing. He's a great guy. Do you think that people just don't, what is it that you I feel like is his kind of, the problem with I the American I think a lot of maybe? people like him. I mean, you know, he, I mean, Larry King, who was on before him, was a whole different animal. Piers is very, very sharp. I mean, and I like the way he interviews. It's kind of, it's kind of fun, you know. He's a fun, he's fun to interview and fun to be interviewed by. Yeah, provoca a bit of a provocative. Yeah, provocative. A bit like yourself. And he's very attractive, too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's <laughs> giggling now. He's got hands I, I know, it's, I know, yeah. I know his wife, and, and his wife is really beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful Caroline. As well. Yes, yeah, she's, she's uh, lovely. See, yeah, she's she's rather beautiful. Um, yes. I want to I want to be from uh, from I suppose like one one sort of bastion of Britishness to another. Yes, the Queen. The Queen. You met the Queen. You, I met the Queen. You received a medal from the Queen. Here she we are. She was your very medal. lovely. Uh, oh, yeah, you that's and, my medal. I think we've got Jackie and, and OBE. Uh, Order OBE of the medal, British wonderful. So I was very kind of, I didn't know what to say to her, and it was like nerve-wracking. And, and then This was a few are. weeks ago, actually. This there I am you and the Queen. The so queen. what did she yes. say to you then? You, get the med you got the medal, and then what so did she say? So they give you instructions. I mean, all the footmen are lovely. They have such great senses of humor, and they're like, well, you know, you'll like this, and it'll be fun, and blah, blah, blah. But then they line you all up, because the whole group of people that are getting various awards, and they line you all up, and they say, now, this is what you have to do. When you meet the Queen, she will say a few words to you. She will pin on your medal. She'll say a few words. But when she proffers her hand, you have to leave. But you cannot turn your back on her. You have to back away four or five steps. And everybody's going, but we're all going to trip up. <laughs> and so it's all very formal. So finally, you all have to line up to go through. And, and then you go through. And then finally, your name is called. And you have to walk forward. And then you stand by a footman for a minute while the other person backs up who was there before you. And they go off. And then you go forward. And the queen is there. And she leans forward. And she pins the medal on you. And then she says, she said to me, she says, well, um, I understand that you've written many, many books. And I said, 
yeah, not bad for a school dropout, huh? And I, I realized I'd said the wrong thing. It was far too, you know, airy. And, uh, and then there was an awkward silence. And then I said, you, uh, you know, ma'am, I, I want to say that you're extremely beautiful. And she said, oh, thank you. Hand came out, <laughs> quick as a flash. I shook her hand and I backed up without tripping up. And I went off and had a fabulous lunch for 40 people <laughs> to celebrate. That's it was I mean, great. It was sort of great. Been because a highlight, surely. Was it was a highlight. highlight. It was a highlight really? because, you know, I was raised in England. Um, and although I live in Beverly Hills now, the, the queen is the queen. You know, you, you were raised seeing her and her sister, Princess Margaret, all the time. And, and it was just a very nice experience. It was lovely. I loved it. It felt very English. Yeah, no, and you yeah. know, I, I, I still feel like that. There's, there's a lot of love for the monarchy. They seem to reinvent oh, yes. themselves post Diana and yeah. all that sort of. Oh, I love, um, you know, the one that's married to, no, she said, forgetting her oh, name. Yeah. yeah, Kate. <laughs> Kate, I yes, love Kate. Everyone, everyone likes Kate. Kate is terrific. I mean, she's, she's been sort of pegged as a bit of a role model. I mean, you, you know, we, so with the sort of luckies in mind, I guess when you're writing young, young women and, and you're sort of thinking about young women today, what role models are out there? Do you feel like Kate is a kind of role model? I think model she is figure? a role model because she's great looking. She dresses appropriately, and yet she can dress up and look fantastic too, and she can get down and dance, and she's everything. You know, I think she's lovely. I think she's really lovely. And I, I didn't know Diana, but I did know Dodie Fired extremely well. He was a friend, a very close friend of my fiancé. And uh, I remember riding in the car with him once in Paris and him saying to the driver, go faster, go faster, go faster. He was a speed freak. So when the accident happened, you're thinking, oh, I wonder if he was doing that that night, you know? So but, you, don't uh, think that you don't believe any of the conspiracies then, all those conspiracies? I always believe in conspiracies. I think when you die, you've got the opportunity to either go to heaven or hell, or you can hang around for a while and find out answers to things that you always wanted to know, like what's going on in the Obama's bedroom. Not that I really want to know, but, you know, <laughs> it might be interesting what happened with Kennedy. We could pose the know, question to Jay with, Carney. We could just ask. Yeah, you? yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, interesting. Well, Jackie, you, it's not just uh, us that uh, just adore you at half past five. And Mark Lamont Hill loved you and he was very sad. Oh, we had so much sad. fun last sofa. time. Um, yes. I'm, I'm having fun with you, though, Carolyn. Oh, but yes. you know, I know. It's, it's the Brits together. It's, it's the Brits it's, together. It's the Brits we together. like that. Um, yes. But we had some people commenting in and just, uh, you know, here's, here's one. Tony Holloway says, Oh, Miss Jackie, Lucky was my favorite book when I was a teenager and it helped me down a road. So much fun. Uh, you know, is that the kind of thing? Oh, you, that, that you is so nice. Get along. Well, I get a lot of women. I get this is what I get most of all. Oh, I took my mother's copy of Lucky or Chances and I read it under the covers and you taught me everything I know about sex. And I go, well, I hope your boyfriend or husband is satisfied. And they go, oh, he's a very happy man, very happy. And they say that to me all the time. And then they say, uh, I broke up with my boyfriend. I was lying on the floor in the bathroom thinking, oh, this is terrible. My life is over. And then I thought, what would Lucky do? And I got up and I went out and I'm, you know, feeling great now. So I, I do think she inspires women and I try to inspire women. Sometimes I, I make speeches at places and stuff and I try to be inspirational well, because I want women to be stronger. You know, you, you are inspirational, but you also apparently, and, and I, you've got to correct me if this is wrong, apparently some of your books were banned. And, oh, yes. And so yes, I have yes, this, yes, this yes, is yes, The yes. World is Full of Married Men. And this was this is a book Jackie wrote uh, back in 19, is it, 19, it can't be 68. Yeah, it was 1968. That's that was my first book. Unreal. And it was, it was apparently I delivered banned. it. Well, I delivered it to my publisher and he said, yeah, we love this book. We're going to publish it. And it was 1968, so there, I filled it with four-letter words, and nobody wrote four-letter words in 1968 except men, and, but no women did. And so he said, oh, you know, you're going to have to take out all the four-letter words, otherwise you'll be banned in Australia. So I said, oh, okay, it's my first book, I'll do that. I took out all the four-letter words. We were banned in Australia. We were banned in Boston. We were banned in South Africa. You were banned in Boston? Yes. Why were you banned in I Boston? I don't know. I never found that out. But, you know, weird things happen. I mean, uh, they pirated Hollywood wives in China, and they said they, the, the, the people were lining up like they were getting bread because they, they'd pirated a million copies. And they, I, this is a true story. They sent out the secret police to seize the books. There were no books left because they'd all been sold. And then they were furious, and they said, this is corrupting Chinese youth, and we're going to execute the publishers. Whether they ever did or not, I don't know. But it was in all the papers. That's quite terrifying, the idea I know. that they would execute like, publishers. Yeah, but now I'm, I'm legal in China now. They actually publish my books there. Is there something... I'm published everywhere. I'm published in Russia. I'm very popular in Russia. And I went to Moscow a couple of years ago. It was so interesting because I don't know what they do with all the old people, but I did these signings and they were all 20-somethings. Hundreds of them. And I'm going, are there no old people left in Russia? <laughs> Where are they? Do they just lock them in a room? Because if you think about it, 10 years ago, if you saw Russian women, they were these big, fat women on a beach. Do you remember? And now they're these thin, tall supermodels. Gazelles. Where have they come from? 
These beautiful women, gorgeous. I, don't, I mean, we have to ask Putin. Are you going to be watching, yes. you know, speaking of Putin, you're going to be watching the Olympics. I mean, everyone's talking about the Olympics. There's a big brouhaha, obviously, about these sort of, you know, LGBT stuff and the fact that, you know, Russia has passed these and what seemingly anti-gay Well, I, I love, I love, um, yeah, I love the fact that uh, whenever they talk about it, Craig Ferguson shows the picture of Putin on that horse, naked chested. And, and that's so funny. I mean, it is ridiculous what is going on there. It really is. I mean... Uh, look at, uh, where is it? Is it Nigeria that has actually mm. banned gay people? I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. This is, no, 2014. Yeah. People should be allowed to do what they want to do. If it they is, want to do that, I mean, you know. Well, it's kind of, I feel, I do, I think you're right. I think it's kind of crazy that this is, this is the way it is. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, so, so coming back to something, uh, you know, family is obviously very important to you. Yeah. Uh, and your sister Joan uh, is, uh, you know, she's another strong, feisty well, woman. She's like um, uh, an English icon. Yes, she's, she's. Uh, well, as are you. You're, you're, you're both, I think, oh, English icons. <laughs> uh, but she, she recently was giving an interview, I think it was to the Daily Mail. And it, yeah. She reveals that sex, sex, sex are the three most important factors in her marriage to her husband, Percy Gibson. And, and there she is. I mean, she just. She well, just I miss looks, that. She looks fabulous. great. She looks fabulous. Um, yeah. So and he is a fabulous husband. He's her fifth husband. He's the nicest guy I've ever met. He is so lovely. And they are so in love. And they've been married like 11 years. And everybody said it wouldn't last. And I've never seen two people happier. And they spend like 24 hours in each other's company every day. So how close are you as sisters? I mean, I, do you, still, very do you still sort of phone each other every day? Would she ever, you know, no, do you get when she's in Los Angeles, we talk every day. When she's in Europe, we talk maybe once a week. Yeah. We're very different, but we're very close. And in terms of, you know, your own children, I mean, what, what's that? You've got three daughters. I have three daughters. I have three amazing daughters who are my best friends. One of them um, has, has a new company called Patton. She makes these fabulous bags, leather bags, sort of carry bags, and she just started that company. She sold her own old company, which was Tiny Tilia, to Avon, and now she's got this new company. My other daughter, Rory, has uh, written a book called Playing Along, Rory Samantha Green, and it's on Amazon, and it's fabulous. You would love it. Fantastic. It's a kind of a quirky romantic comedy about an English rock star and an American girl. That's fun. And my third daughter, um, she works with abused children in London. So That's a real, I mean, that's a very different kind of career path, I guess. I know it is, but they all followed what they wanted to do. And they're really great, you know. So, I, I just think they're fabulous. You know, wait, wait, obviously because you were in the public eye for so long. I mean, were you, were you, was sort of, you know, kind of in terms of what you part, you know, gave them in terms of your well, teaching it's and, and raising because them? Because I, I never left them. I raised them. They were with me all the time. I remember going to Chicago to do uh, Oprah Winfrey's show, and I took all three kids with me. And um, they're in the hotel. I'm out there doing the show, and I come back from the show, and one of them looks at me and she says, "That's interesting." And I said, "What?" She was about six at the time. She said, well, she said, who is Jackie Collins? She said, you just walked in. You look just like her. But Jackie Collins is somebody different on the television. So it was interesting that they could see that when I was on the television, I was different. To, I was his mum, you know. That's fine. So do you feel that like you have kept kind of a different personal life to private life? Do we know, very, the, do we know the real Jackie Collins? I mean, I, you're sitting with me today, but do people really know the real Jackie Collins? Well, my friends do. Yeah. I mean, I, I, my husband had clubs in London. He had a club called the Adelib where all the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Eric Clapton used to hang out all the time. In fact, Ringo gave him a cigar when our first daughter was born. And, um, and then he had another club called Dollars and another club called Tramp, which was very famous. So I raised my kids in a kind of weird way with no sleep because we would go out to the, well, I would get up and make them breakfast in the morning, take them to school. Then I would write all day. Then I would meet them from school. I would be writing in the car on the way to school at stoplights. And then I would bring them home and I would give them dinner and put them to bed and give them their bath and all of that. And then about 10 o'clock at night, my husband and I would go out to one of his clubs and stay there till about 2 or 3 in the morning. And then I would come home and have about 4 hours sleep. And then start all over again. Wow. But I never left them. It's like you're the original multitasker, basically. Yeah, uh, I think so, you know, actually. I, I, when looking back on it, yes. I, I, I feel like you've done so much as well, you know, just, just to kind of... Um to sort of come back to sort of present day Jackie. Yeah. In terms of success, yeah. obviously, you know, de definitions of success change with age. And we, do, we have this uh, series here called Third Metric where we right. redefine success beyond money and power. Uh, so, you know, what does success mean to you today? Well, if I was going to be flippant, I'd say getting the best table in a restaurant is always good. Um, success, it, it's so... It's so easy to define it in different ways when you look at somebody like Justin Bieber. He's had this enormous success. And then you look at the Jonas Brothers. They had that enormous success as big as Justin Bieber. 
And now, you know, it's all really gone away. I mean, they're still doing stuff, but they don't have what they had. And I wonder if young kids realize it's all going to go away. I think success is something you live with, but you don't think, oh, I'm so successful. Isn't that great? You don't think about it. It's just there. You're lucky that you have been that successful because it's all about luck and timing and being in the right place at the right time. I mean, I think it's very difficult for new novelists today, for instance, to get the attention that they want because there's so much out there. There's so much to do. I know myself, I would like to have six more hours every day because I'm on the internet. I'm watching all these TV shows. You know, I'm reading all these magazines, all these newspapers, reading books, writing, and all of the stuff there is to do. And when you think about kids today, you know, I love the fact that they're taking off Jay Leno. Don't they understand that, that young kids, I mean, 18, 19 year olds, are not watching that show anyway? Right. They couldn't care less whether it's Jay Leno or Jimmy Fallon. They're out at the clubs, you know, or they're on their, their computers, or they're watching porn. You know, they're not going to watch those shows. So keep Jay Leno, who's great. I well, love Jay. Yeah, well, he is, he, is, he is really great, as are you, Jackie Hans. It's just yeah. such a pleasure. I, Thank is, you so this much. This went so quickly. This was, was really was fun. So fun. And uh, yeah. I, I know we have, we have the book cover. Let me just try and zoom in if I can here. A little oh, bit great. better, but uh, let me see if I can do that. There we go. Yeah. Jackie Collins. Lucky this is, she discovers this is, uh, this sex, is drugs, American and rock and roll. Sex, drugs, rock and roll. The whole, the whole thing. The, the whole, whole thing. Yeah, she, and a little bit of me in there, too. <laughs> and a little bit of Jackie <laughs> yes. And guys, don't forget that Jackie's brand new book, Confessions of a Wild Child, is out now. You can check it out. And you can, of course, catch Jackie at Barnes & Noble on February 5th on East 86th Street, 7 o'clock for a reading and a signing if you are in New York City. But Jackie, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. Thank you, Caroline. It, it was, was great. I enjoyed talking to you. It was so fun. And guys, stay with us. There is, of course, a lot more coming up on HuffPost Live.